Okay, IED, we're going to talk today about activity 2.2.7. This is design for manufacturability and assembly. And the last uh, activity, 2.2.6, took a really long time to be able to get through. Uh, we took a carabiner pin and we reverse engineered it and we assembled it. Uh, and it took a long time. And this one's not going to be nearly as long. Uh, we're going to learn a couple of different concepts about how to look at, you know, what makes it easier to manufacture, what makes a product easier uh, or more straightforward. And the basic idea behind this is they want to teach us a lot about Occam's razor or the law of economy. Um, and it's paraphrased as best as uh, Albert Einstein quoted and said, the best design is the simplest one that works. And that's basically what Occam's razor is, is that the simplest solution is usually the best solution. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen so many times whenever we're uh, designing marble sorters in second year engineering or uh, whether or not the, my, my robotics team is making a, the robot and they're trying to uh, come up with a solution and whenever they encounter a problem, one of the things that they try to do is they try to solve the problem with a new solution when that just creates two potentials for things to mess up. And really what you should do is instead of trying to solve a problem with uh, another solution, you should try to merge both problems together and solve them at the same time to try to make it as simple of a solution as possible. And it's hard to do. It's a very hard concept to do uh, in, in, in real life because, I mean, it sounds great, uh, but whenever you're in the thick of it and actually building something, uh, it's hard to have that mindset to go through it. So what we have with this um, setup is there's a couple of different um, guidelines that we have in order to design something uh, with Occam's razor in mind. So they call this, you know, designing for uh, manufacturability and assembly. And there's some guidelines to kind of help out to make sure that you're making sure that your um, part is as optimum as possible. Uh, a couple of these guidelines are, you know, simplify the design by reducing the total number of parts. Uh, use common parts and materials. You really don't want to use exotic materials that you can't find anywhere because then you won't be able to make a whole lot of it. Um, you know, use the same part and or material in multiple locations, which reduces the number of parts in an assembly. Uh, nobody wants to get a table that has 15 different types of screws in it. Most of the time, whenever you buy something and you have to put it together, you're going to realize and see that most of the screws, unless they have to be different, are the same size. And that's to make everybody's life easier. Uh, use readily available off-the-shelf parts rather than manufacturing custom parts. Uh, design for easy f uh, joining of parts. You don't want it to be difficult to put together. Uh, minimize the reorientation of parts during assembly and reduce the number of manufacturing operations. So these are some general guidelines to make your life as easy as possible whenever you're assembling something. And this can work in a manufacturing plant on an assembly line, but this can also work uh, with the thought process of you actually having to assemble something at home. Uh, the concept is the same, except on the assembly line, you're just doing a lot more of it. Uh, so that's a good way to try to think about these guidelines and, and the way people present uh, their products to you. And whenever you guys make stuff, you need to kind of have those in mind as well. Uh, our activity that we're going to do is we're going to have two different types of staplers. Uh, the stapler on the left is going to be the jaw style, or I'm sorry, it's not a stapler. It's a stapler remover. Uh, and so it's the uh, style on the left side where it's got like the little teeth and you clamp down on it and you pull the staple out. Uh, and then the one on the right is the slide style staple remover. And we're going to go through uh, a couple of questions about these. In class, we're going to look at them and analyze them. If you're virtual, you can see pretty much everything from the picture. So I don't think you're going to have to be like, oh, my God, I don't have a stapler remover. You'll, you'll be all right. You just look at the pictures on the left and the right side, and I think you'll be OK. Um, and, and then we'll go through and we'll answer these questions. Um, so for you know part one, take a look at the two different styles. Uh, what visual similarities do you notice between the two products? What visual differences do you notice? So they have similarities. They have differences. Write those down. Uh, number two, uh, use both staple removers to remove a few embedded staples, making careful observations about the performance of each. Uh, what operational similarities do you notice between the two products? And what operational differences do you notice? So like they're going to, in some senses, they're going to behave the same. Uh, and in some senses, they're going to behave different. And then on number three, uh, we need to conduct a functional analysis of the jaw style 
and then you know you, they've got an example for you to use if you need to and it says you know identify the product's name and the company name identify the purpose or primary function uh, sketch an isometric pictorial of the product and label the individual components. Uh, if you're virtual and you're at home, you do not have to list the product's name or the company name because you can't see it. Uh, so, you know, you just want to try to identify the purpose and primary function. Uh, let's see here. Sketch an isometric pictorial of the product and label the individual components. If you're not sure what particular component is called, then just, you know, make a logical guess. Uh, call it something. You know, try not to be vague, but, you know, try to call it something at least. Uh, what simple machines are used as a part of the devices to remove staples? Uh, a couple of years ago, y'all should have learned about simple machines. I'm going to go into a lot more detail on it next year in second year engineering or principles of engineering. Uh, what mechanism do you think is used in the jaw type staple remover to return the hinge material components to their original position after you release the pressure? Okay, what mechanism do you think is used in the jaw type staple remover? So that's what it's asking for, is, is what do you think is causing it to go back to normal? Uh, then using a black box systems model, identify the system inputs, intended product function and outputs, uh, document what mechanical components and mechanisms are visible, uh, predict what you might find when the staple removers are taken apart. What might the hidden components do? So, um, you know, obviously, we're, we're, not, we're not actually going to take these apart in class either. So, basically, you want to try to just give a deep inspection of the object and, and what you might find when the staple removers are taken apart. So, even if you're virtual, you can still do that. Uh, then, they've got a video, so you'll click on the link and you'll watch the jaw style staple remover product disassembly video uh, to identify all the parts. And then, you'll list them all on the product disassembly chart. Uh, you'll give them each of them a part number. You'll fill in the quantity. Uh, you'll add one co column to the title and or to the chart, and you're going to call it number of interfaces. And you're going to list the number of interfaces for each part. So N I capital N little I number of interfaces. Uh, the number of interfaces is the number of other parts that the part connects to or interacts with. So if it connects or interacts with two different pieces, then it would have an NI of two. The NI, or the number of interfaces, is going to be the same as, you're going to do it for every single part. So every single part has a number of interfaces that goes along to it. So in the example that they give us down below, uh, each one of these individual parts has a NI of two. And then if you want to find the number of interfaces in total, you will add them all up. So that's one, two, and then this one over here has three, four, and then the one on the bottom has five, six. So that even though there's only three interconnecting pieces, there are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, interacting, uh, you know, number of interactions between the two. So the total NI would be six in this case whenever we add them all up. That's all we have to do is we just have to sum them all together. Okay. Um, that's probably going to be it. For, well, no, I, one more thing. We'll go ahead and okay. put one more thing in there. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is the complexity factor. Uh, the complexity factor can be calculated by just adding up all of the parts. That's what this little sigma right here means. It means add up, and NP is the number of the parts. So if it has five parts, you just put five there. Okay. Uh, if it has ten parts, you're just going to put the number ten there. Uh, and then you're going to multiply it by the number of the, the sum of the number of the interfaces, so all of them together. So if there were five parts, and in total there were ten interfaces between those five parts, then that would be five times ten, which is fifty, and the complexity factor would be the square root of fifty, whatever that number comes out to be as a decimal. So that's how you would calculate the complexity factor and we're going to do that for the uh, stapler as well, too. So for the very end, make sure that you answer uh, questions 1, 2, and 3 right below the complexity factor. And that's going to do it for uh, part 1 of this. The, the next part involves doing something that's a little bit different. We're going to kind of shift things up a little bit. So for part 1, once you get to the complexity factor down here, 1, 2, 3, you're good to go. I hope this was helpful to you guys. Have a great time, and I'll talk at you later.